Christians, there's a couple of teammates in the Bible I wanna talk about. And so let me pray and we'll launch into it. God, thanks for this great family, the great family room you've blessed us with. This is your house where we've come to worship you corporately with all of our hearts. And now we turn our attention to your word and we pause and say, Holy Spirit, speak through your voice, through your spokesperson to hearts all across this auditorium and listening online. And I pray nothing but God's best, your best for every single individual listening to this message. Challenge us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been on some amazing teams throughout my life. Anybody been on some good teams? Three people, awesome. Uh, it's, it's interesting too. I mean, just as an athlete, but there's, it's not just athletic teams. There's been you know, student council teams and there's maybe you're on the knitting team or whatever the team is. There's, there's something about being on a team I think that's so good for us as we grow through life. I've also had great teammates. Specifically, the older teammates on the teams I've been on that have been so humble and gracious to, to pour into me, to model for me what it looks like to be a leader, to be a good teammate, all throughout my career. And maybe that's happening, you know the person at your workplace that, I mean, they're super smart, they've had a ton of experience, and instead of like belittling you or threatened by you taking their job, they pour into you and they train you. Don't you love people like that, by the way? I've been so blessed. I, I, today, I stand on the shoulders of so many that have poured into me, all, all facets of all the different teams uh, you know, I was thinking about when I was a high school kid. Where are my high schoolers? Any high schoolers at church today? Yeah, come on, let's give it up for our high schoolers, man. Y'all, love you guys. Like, I didn't want to be here. My parents made me. No, not you guys, but other people. I remember making the varsity team as a sophomore, the, bas the baseball team. And I remember specifically, there were like seniors on the team that just, they showed me the way. They, they were encouraging. They showed me how, how to succeed. I go to Iowa State, play as a true freshman. Talk about being scared in the big eight. I was the smallest guy on the field most of the time. These big, ugly dudes trying to kill me every single time. And I remember the seniors took me under their wing and they trained me and they, you know, they trained me in some good ways, not some not so good ways. I mean, dragged me to Tazzles, the college bar. I, they weren't bringing me up. They were bringing me low at that point. But do you know what I'm talking about? Just these guys. And I, re I remember I, I was going from the, NFL to the, the AFL, that was for people that aren't real good, they, they land in the arena football league, and it's a different game. This game is like, instead of 100 yards, it's like packed into like 50 yards, and there was a guy named Aaron Garcia who had been there for years, and he took me, you know, right by his side and, and basically taught me the game, and it was so cool because I grew from that place. Is anybody here at church just grateful for the people that have poured into your life and have modeled for you what it is? It, it's, it's powerful. Why do I talk about that? Well, that's exactly what you read in the scriptures this past week. There was a prophet of God named Elijah with a J, and he was God's man, uh, King Ahab, Evil King Ahab and Jezebel were on the scene and God called Elijah to be the prophet to call them out, to challenge them. It was the voice of God through him. And then over time, God spoke to Elijah and said, hey, I want you to raise up a young guy, Elisha, and he's gonna take your starting job after a while. And he calls him. If you're, if you're a note taker, you can jot down the notes before we even get there. This, this young man was called. Someone say called. He, he was called by God through Elijah to take his job. And Elijah was the man to raise Elisha up. And so you'll see it in the text. He, he goes and he anoints him. He challenges him. He said, hey man, you're gonna be the next man up. I want you to be my assistant for six years. And he makes a commitment. You're gonna see, he's, he's like plowing the field. The dude is just trying to do his job. God calls him, but he commits his life to God to do what God's asked him to do. And we're gonna see this second part committed in 
my, my favorite point is the consistency you see of this young man. And I think to me personally, don't you know this by the way, if you look at humanity, the most consistent people are the ones that are the most successful. It's easy to start out your relationship with Christ or get on a team and you know when it's going well or it's new and it's exciting, then it's good. But what happens when you get to that mid part of the season or you get two or three years down the road and you haven't started yet? Do you hit the transfer portal? Do you continue on? And so I love, I wanna speak this message called teammates because I wanna see where we're at. Have you gotten in the game? Are you in the stands, in the seats? Are you like in the game? <laughs> Are you serving? Are you going all in? Yeah, your jersey's gonna get dirty, but wouldn't you rather actually live the Christian life and actually be on the team and get in the game? So that's gonna be your challenge. I also have a dream <laughs> that this church Everybody's in a small group. And then from the small group, everybody has a mentor that they're, they're walking through life with. You know what? I, I, I wish the church would go from whatever it is, a couple thousand, down to four to 14, down to one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two. -two. You see it all throughout the Bible. You're gonna see with Elijah and Elisha. You saw it with uh, Jesus and his disciples. You saw it with uh, Paul and Timothy. You see it with, with Moses and Joshua. What do you see? One-on-one -on -one discipleship. All throughout the entire human existence, we see this replicating of disciples, good teammates. So let's check it out, 1 Kings 19, and let's start with this idea of being called. So God speaks to Elijah with a J, and here's what he says in the second part of verse 16. 1 Kings 19, 16b, he says, anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola, sounds like he's from Hawaii or something, to replace you as my prophet. Someone say called. If you're a Christian in here, God is calling you right now. Here's what I hear. Um, I'm not called to full-time ministry. Can I just break that wall real quick and just say, you and I, <laughs> if we're a Christian, you are called to full-time ministry. It might be in an elementary school, it might be at a, uh, a business, it might be at school, but you and I are on full, we are called. Someone say called. We, we are called. I, I love it. In this season of my life, <laughs> well, let me just go back. I had been a Christian for probably a year, and I was going to this church in Fort Lauderdale. Florida, it's an amazing church. I didn't know church could be like that. I remember being invited. Some random guy at the beach invited me. I showed up. And remember, you gotta know my, my background. It, uh, I grew up going to a very conservative Baptist church, hymns, pews, robes, the whole idea. I walk into this place in Fort Lauderdale. They have like a full band. This guy's got a mullet playing guitar, like rocking out. I was like, what? Is, am I sinning right now? Like, what is happening? Probably how like, some of you guys just walked in and are like, what is happening, right? And then some guy gets up and he's just teaching right through the Bible. I understand what he's saying. He's making me cry one minute. He's making me laugh. I'm understanding. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is great. But I would come in and out of church. I didn't know anybody. It was a big church. Somehow, someway, my real estate agent down in Fort Lauderdale saw that I really wanted to grow, but I was not connected in the church. And so one of her fellow real estate agents, she's like, man, I think you'd connect with this guy. So she literally set us up on like a bro date. <laughs> I mean, it was like a blind date with a dude. It was kind of, it was just weird. <laughs> but I took the shot downfield. We ate a burger at Chili's, we connected. He's like, yo, bro, like, what's up? His name was Mickey Marijuana Caruana, greatest dude in the world, male model and real estate agent. It's true. <laughs> and I thank God for Mickey. You know why? Because after connecting, he said, so what, do you, what team are you on at the church? Where are you, where are you serving? I was like, oh, um, well, you know, I'm praying about it, you know. Huh? <laughs> he goes, well, um, you like kids, right? I was like, yeah, man, I like hanging with kids. Can you shoot, can you shoot a three-pointer? Like, yeah. 
He's like, all right, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna come with me to Tuesday night sports ministry and then Wednesday night student ministry. So he signed me up. He got me on the team two times. He's like, just, he's like you're coming with me, right? I'm like, yeah. Guess I'm on a team. Which, by the way, side note, the first volunteer training meeting I went to, I met my wife. Just saying. I roll with Mickey to this place, and I'm telling you, the, the calling in my life, it started with just saying yes to a tap on the shoulder. Let me just say real quickly, if you're, let me just raise a hand if you're, volu- you're already a volunteer at this church. Raise your hand real quick, okay. Look at all the people. You're already on a team. You can put them down, okay. Here, here's, I'm giving you homework, and it's not even the end of the message. Here's what, be a Mickey, Find someone in your sphere of influence that you know is hungry and wanting to move forward in their faith. Listen, the folks that are just not quite there yet, don't headlock someone, that's kind of weird. I was ready, I was really wanting God's best. I really wanted to move forward. I had lived the previous 20 plus years of my life trying to do my own thing and reaping the consequences. I was ready for something new. So find that person and bring them with you. Put the, like, fluorescent pink vest on them in the parking team and be like, yo, let's go. Okay, Gavin, that's, that's your son. What will it do? It very well could unlock the calling of some person's life that's been complacent in the seats and has not gotten in. Because here, here's, and let me just say this. A lot of people, the reason they're not on a team is they're like, man, I don't know enough. I'm not Billy Graham. I was far from Billy Graham. You're like, yeah, it's 25 years later and you're still from, <laughs> far from, the, got no game. What it was, it was just a heart to help. To this day, it's a heart to help. Someone say called. So Elijah, here's the word from God. He goes to Elijah, bro- breaks open the flask of oil and that's what they would do. That's how you would signify that you're called and anointed him with oil. He said, yo, bro, like, let's go. And he had the choice at that point. What is Elisha gonna do? Is he gonna get on the team? Is he gonna spend some time with Elijah? Is he gonna spend six years with Elijah? By the way, how awesome would it be to be like right next to Elijah through his ministry? You guys have been reading about Elijah, what he's done? How about that? Like, uh, how about just 1 Kings 18 when Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal who the real God is? It's him versus 450. Talk about those odds. So, uh, let's, here's what we're gonna do. If you, if you missed the reading, go back. It's fantastic. He said, okay, we're gonna both kill some, some animals and make animal sacrifice. And you guys, you guys go first. Pray for calling your gods. And if your God comes down with fire and consumes the offering, then you know what? Baal's real, he's the real God. But if he doesn't, then it's my turn. And then I'm gonna call on Yahweh, the the true God, and he's gonna consume it with fire. I mean, that that took some, I can't say it in church, how do I say this? That that took some boldness. (laughs) (laughs) And I love it, the story's so good, isn't it great? Because they're they're like, the, the prophets of Baal, they're like, Ah, oh, they're cutting themselves and dancing and going, come on, and nothing happens. And Elijah's like, Eli- remember, you're Elisha, it's just with Elijah. And Elijah's like, um, what happened, bro? Like, is your God out to lunch? Is he in the restroom? Like, what, what happened? Is he not hearing you? Like, sarcastic preachers, they're crazy. And after a while, Elijah goes, can you just prove to these people and the rest of everybody who you really are, God? And he, Elijah, pours water over it. I mean, pours water over it like three times and God just shows off with fire. (laughs) Consumes the fire, licks up the dust, proving who he is. You're Elisha. You get this opportunity. You're gonna take my starting job in six years. What do you want to do? Well, the good news is he commits. He says yes. 
There's a lot of people right now, God's asking you to jump in the game and go all in, and you have a choice just like he did. He commits. Look at the, the next verse in verse 19. So Elijah went and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing a field. I love that, by the way. What was he doing? He was just being faithful in little things behind the scenes, plowing the field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. It was 12th string. Elijah went over to him, threw his cloak across his shoulders, and then walked away. Now, again, at that time, he would know what that meant. It's like, bro, he's tapping his shoulder, next man up, and he threw his cloak, his shawl over him, and then walked away. Elisha, he knew what was up, so he left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, hey, first let me go, kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I'm gonna go with you. I'm gonna commit to this. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I've done to you. Now, I'll pause there real quick. I, I was studying this and I was thinking, you know, when we give altar calls or we challenge people or when God challenged me in my truck when I came to Christ or when Mickey challenged me, I think it's wise. Jesus said, count the cost. Some people will say, well, I'll just pray a prayer and then I'll just keep on living my, my, my life the way that I always have. I think it's wise to count the cost. There are some things that might have to be eliminated from our lives. And I, it's not God being a big ogre, it's because he knows there's something better for us. He says, just pause for a second and make sure you're all in on this because it's not gonna be any easier. It's not always gonna be like 1 Kings 18 and, and every, everything's good. You know what happened right after that huge victory? Elijah was, was hit with a, a, bout a, depression, a bout of depression and he runs from Jezebel and hides in a cave and says, God, kill me now. Just think about it. And I would just say that to all of us. Think about it. I was at a pastor's conference one, once and a young preacher that was, he was actually thinking about going full-time ministry, vocational ministry, he asked, well, how do I know if I'm called to, to full-time ministry? And Gail Irwin was his name. He had these big suspenders. Dude was hilarious. And he looked at the young man and he said, go try and do everything else you can and if you still don't have a piece, then you're called to full-time vocational ministry. Why was he saying that? Because he knows, like, it's, it is gut-wrenching and depressing and crazy at times. That's what Elijah is saying to Elisha. And just to go all in with Jesus, it's not always gonna be easy. Just think about it. Well, Elijah, Elisha, excuse me, <laughs> returned to his oxen. And what did he do? He slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow. So he, his livelihood, what he was doing vocationally at that time, he kills that. He breaks up the wood that he was using as the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, showing the rest of the crew that he was all in, that he was committed and they all ate. Then he went with Elisha, or Elijah, excuse me, as his assistant. He was committed. He was all in. He's like, all right, man, through, through the ebbs and the flows, the highs and the lows, I'm committed. And it's been my experience, the people that walk with a mentor and grow the most are the ones that are there through the ups and the downs. Elijah, <laughs> and, it, and it's six years, and that's really the number three thing. Write it down, consistent. Now move over to 2 Kings chapter two. 2 Kings chapter two, and let's fast forward for a second because he goes all in, full send, full commitment. Six years goes by, and there's droughts, and there's threats on their life, and there's chaos. And somewhere along the line, there's a prophecy that Elijah 
is gonna be translated to heaven. He's not gonna die, he's just gonna go to heaven. By the way, wouldn't that be wild? Like Enoch, if you read the story in, way back in Genesis, it said that Enoch walked with God and then he was not. That'd be so dope. Wouldn't that be awesome? You don't have to like worry about how you're gonna die. Like God just came to you, he's like, don't worry about it, you're not gonna die physically, you know, a death. I'm just gonna come get you. <laughs> and so, which really, it's, it's, it's actually a picture of the rapture of the church in the Old Testament, by the way. One day, the Bible says that the Lord will descend with a shout and, and those Christians will, <laughs> will bounce up to heaven and not have to worry about that physical death. It's fascinating. So word gets out on Twitter that Elijah is gonna be raptured. And so it's kind of the end of his career, the end of his time, and now he's gonna pass the baton on to Elisha, who is his second string, his backup, who's gonna take the starting job. And so verse one of 2 Kings 2 says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. Circle that real quick, we're gonna come back to that. They were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Underline that, circle that in your Bible, we're gonna come back to that. But Elisha replied, as surely, I love his response, as surely as the Lord you, and you yourself live, what does he say? I will never, I will never leave you. So they went down together at Bethel. Pause there real quick. I just love the consistency right there. The prophet Elijah is actually trying to get rid of poor Elisha. He's like, bro, just stay here. I got other things to do before I bounce. And Elisha's like, no, man, you can't, you can't get rid of me. I'm following you. There's something about loyalty in this day and age that is so scarce to me. If I'm, if I'm not promoted, in two weeks as the CEO, I'm gonna go find another job. Some of the, the most respect I have for people, there's these, these guys, one of my boys plays college football and there's a guy on the team who's been, he came in at the same time as this other running back, he easily could have hopped in the transfer portal. Instead, he's like, you know what, I'm committed to this team. I'm gonna show up with my best attitude and effort every single day and the guy that he was behind went to the NFL this, this past offseason. He started, and the guy's blowing up right now, years later. It's consistent. It's like, no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It reminds me of Ruth. Remember Ruth and Naomi in the book of Ruth? Naomi's like, dude, your husband's already dead. Like, just go back to your hometown. And Ruth looks at Naomi and is like, no, man, I'm coming with you. I'm gonna serve your God. Something beautiful about that whole consistency, loyalty. Verse three, the group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? This is like a little seminary class of students that were on Twitter and got the word as well. And they're like, yo, don't you know he's about to bounce up to heaven? And he's like, yo, be quiet about that. I don't wanna hear about that. I know that. Be quiet about it. Verse four, then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord's now told me to go to Jericho. Underline that, to go to Jericho. Stay here. How many times, man, like you've been following a mentor, you've been walking with a teammate, you've been on a team, and there's been this voice in your mind that goes, man, just, just leave now. It's getting a little hard. And he's like, no, I'm with you, man. God's called me to this. I'm, I don't, through thick and thin, I don't care if I feel like it or not, I'm following you, I'm gonna be consistent. I'm gonna walk with you. They go through the whole spiel again, the group of prophets from this town. Don't you know he's gonna be translated? I know about it, whatever. Verse six, then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord's told me to go to the Jordan River. Underline that, circle Jordan. So put yourself in Elisha's shoes. Is this guy just trying to get rid of me? We've been walking together for six years. I am not leaving you. Go down to the Jordan. Verse 
verse seven, 50 from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance. <laughs> it's so cool. As Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River, then Elijah folded his cloak together, like takes off his little sweatshirt, you know. <laughs> he, he folds it together by the, the Jordan River and he strikes the water with it. The river divided and the two of them went across on dry ground, like you do. Like after church here, let me challenge you. Go take your sweatshirt, go down to the Elkhorn River and be like, by the power of God, just strike the water and see if it like parts for you. <laughs> when they came to the other side, Elijah, verse nine, said, Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. This reminds me of when God came to Solomon and looked at Solomon and he's like, hey, whatever you want, I'm gonna give it to you. Solomon asks for wisdom and God blesses him abundantly. And Elisha's response is interesting. He doesn't ask for wealth or, here's his response. Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. Isn't that cool? In the ancient days at that time, when a father passed on, his oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance and then the rest of the kids would get a little bit less. And they would then assume the spiritual um, leadership in the family. And that's in essence what Elisha is asking. He's really, it's almost two things. It's like, yo, I wanna be, I wanna be the starter and I wanna lead Israel spiritually and um, can I just ask for like a little double of the spirit upon me? And once you know it, God answers this and when you follow in the Bible, there's actually double the amount of miracles cited in the scriptures that Elisha performed, 16, and Elijah had 18. He won, he's like, and, and I love, here's the thing too. Eli, I see Elisha's heart. All he wants to do is help as many people as he, he's trying to get Israel back on track. So he's like, hey man, I wanna be your successor. I wanna be the starter. I've been walking with you as a teammate. You've showed me the way. You've been gracious to me. God's been gracious. I know he's called me to it. Verse 10, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you'll get your request. But if not, then you won't. In other words, stay close. It's about to happen. And as they were walking and talking, to me, that's good teammates, man, doing life together. And, and when you get on a team, and when you get a mentor or you're a mentor and you're investing in a mentee, you're walking, you're talking, you're breaking bread together, you're talking about life, praying for one another, working through tough times, they're walking and talking. Suddenly a chariot of fire, now put yourself in the situation, a chariot of fire appeared drawn by horses of fire. Just fire comes down. It drove between the two men separating them and Elijah was carried, not by the chariot or the horses, he was carried by a whirlwind. He was carried by a storm into heaven. Elisha, he did indeed, he saw it. He cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel, and they disappeared from sight. Elisha tore his clothes in distress. What an interesting did you read this? And when you're like, well, I can't even picture that in my mind. I'm walking with my teammate. I'm walking, talking. I know it's about to happen. All of a sudden, separates them. He bounces up to heaven. Elisha tears his clothes in distress. I remember when my mentor, Pastor Steve, who poured so much into me when I knew he was going to get called back to heaven how rough that was, and you guys experience it as well. You have a father, a mother, a grandparent, best friend, mentor, pass. That's where he's at. He's in this place of distress, but also he's been following them. There's an anointing that's falling on him. And so with the anointing, verse 13, Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, so Elijah bounces to heaven. He's basically naked. His clothes fall down. He picks up his shawl, right, which, he had, fall, which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water, just like Elijah did. I do, you watch. I do, you do. 
He struck it and cried out, where's the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided and Elisha went across. Now pause there real quick. This is fascinating. He watches, God blesses him with a double portion and immediately he does the same exact miracle. So the last miracle that his mentor, his master performed was the first miracle that Elisha performed. And I heard this when I was studying this week and this fascinated me. Wouldn't we as Christians, wouldn't it be smart for us to do the same thing from our master? The last miracle Jesus did on, our, on this planet, wouldn't it be smart for us Christians to also walk in that miracle? Anybody with me still? Y'all, y'all still with me? This is crazy. Maybe I'm just a geek and nerd. I'll get into this Bible stuff. Sorry, but. What was the last miracle that Jesus performed on the planet? It's like Bible quiz, like pop quiz right in the middle of church. And I'm gonna give you a, a hint. The man Malchus. Remember Malchus? Anybody? I'll give you another hint. Everybody just point to your ear real quick, okay? Remember the setting? Jesus about to go to heaven and he's in the garden and the the soldiers come to wrongfully arrest him. And Peter, I love, don't you love Peter? Peter stands up, he's like, you're not gonna arrest my master, my mentor. I'm gonna die for, and he takes his sword out And he goes to Malchus, one of the soldiers, and he whacks his, you know what he was really going for? Malchus is a good athlete. He's like, you know. The ear slices off. There's just like a flesh ear just on the ground. And I'm picturing the scene. There's just blood gushing out. Everybody's yelling. Malchus is like, ah! He's yelling, but he can't hear. Blood's coming out. And Jesus, don't you, love Je- don't you love your master? Talk about having the best teammate. Jesus shows the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, between law and grace in the moment. And the miracle, that his last miracle should be our first miracle. What does Jesus do? He picks up the ear. He prays and he heals Mal. Can you imagine me and Malchus? Oh. What just happened? I think it's a beautiful picture. Here here it is. Follow me. I think there's a lot of us Christians that are trying to slice heads off and ears off as opposed to the miracle of mending and trying to see people healed that are separated from God. I also believe in the church we're fighting over theological stances as a, and slicing each other's heads and ears off and there's blood going out of our ear and we can't hear each other. How about we just pause and listen to someone? How about we completely disagree but I have the humility and the grace to have a conversation with a non-believer or a believer with a different theological stance than you do? I think that Jesus, our master, the miracle he performed is actually modeling for us what the present day Christian should be doing at this point. So good. The rest of the text is pretty interesting because the, the seminary students are observing. Remember, they're close by and they just look and they're like, oh my goodness. The spirit of Elijah is double portion on Elisha. Holy smokes, there was fruit. There was evidence of the anointing, the spirit of God upon this man, this teammate of Elijah. He had taken the starting job and his first drive, his first game, he went 20 for 20 with like four touchdowns. It's beautiful. And I wanna end with this and then we're gonna show you a video. This is something that as I was studying that, that I was drawn to that was really cool. And it was the progression of the cities that Elijah went to before he was translated to heaven. And I believe that it's very significant. It was a journey with Elijah and Elisha. And if he was consistent walking with Elijah, he was gonna get the double portion of the spirit for ministry and impact the rest of his life. What was the first city that they started at? 
Gilgal. Bible students, you recall Gilgal was the first town after the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea into the Promised Land, and before they went and conquered their enemies because there was giants in the land, the first town was Gilgal, and God told Moses, or told Joshua, what did he say to him? You need to be circumcised. What? Awesome, dude. Like, we're taking ground, and all the military men are gonna be, uh, what's the word, incapacitated, or I don't even know the word, for a while. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But, but, but stay with me. You know what's so powerful about that? God is saying, if we want a double portion of his spirit in ministry, it starts with cutting away the flesh and being purified. Paul said what? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Paul said there's a battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. And it starts. You want, I think a lot of people want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but they don't want to be emptied of self. It starts with being emptied of self. I want to be filled with the Spirit, but I kind of want to have my pets in here too. Not going to work. You, will, you won't get a double portion. Two is Bethel. Remember Bethel? Bethel's significant too. Bethel means the house of God. This is when um, it was Jacob and Esau. Jacob had hoodwinked his brother and then bounced, and he's feeling all guilty, and, and he's like on the run, and he passes out, puts his head on a rock. I don't know how he fell asleep with the head on the rock, not a pillow. And he has this revelation of God, this dream, and it was like this, this, these angels, and, and they were going up and down from heaven to earth, and it was the very son of God. It was this revelation that no matter in my sin or in my shame, God is with me right there. And let me just speak this to someone. You, you go, I can't have a double portion. There's no ministry for me. You don't know what I have done. Can I just tell you, it's one of the biggest lies that keeps Christians off the team. You and I are not perfect, and we're gonna blow it, but man, I'm telling you, God wants to get you in the game. In fact, he'll use some of your worst sin to actually be a bridge to bring people to Christ if you'll allow it. Jericho, they go down to Jericho. Jericho, what happened at Jericho? I'll give you a hint. Come on, someone talk to me. They walked around the walls, heavy military walls, no one could get through them, strongholds. They walked around how many days? Six at first, because it was six days, one. But then the seventh day, how many? See, man, we got some theologians on the front row. Must be Zion. They had to hear it his entire life. Sorry, buddy. The seventh day, they walked around how many times? Then they what? They shouted, and the walls collapsed. The strongholds went down. Let me just say, if you want a double portion of God's spirit, it is not so you can pop spiritual wheelies and show everybody how cool you are with your gift to interpret tongues. It is for strongholds to be broken and souls to be saved and Jesus to be exalted. Jericho. And the last one is Jordan. I love this. Jordan. Maybe this one's for you. It's so cool. Jordan signifies expectation. Mike preaches this so well. When they were gonna enter the promised land, God told them to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence of God. And he told the, he said the priest need to put their, they need to take a step into the Jordan. If I'm the priest, I'm like, hey, why don't you just go ahead and part the Jordan and then I'm glad to, to step through. That wouldn't take faith. He says, take a step, and then it will open. You know what? God's, God's telling someone in this place, take a step into the Jordan to get on a team. Take a step to be a mentor. Take a step and expect God to blow the doors open. He's doing it. I thank God when Mickey Marijuana Caruana came to me and tapped me on the shoulder <laughs> that I didn't say, nah, bro, I, I, 
You don't know what I've done. I don't have what it takes. I would have missed out of 25 years of ministry. The Bible says in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, double portion, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. It's God's spirit through you. Do you want that double portion? Take a step, take a step. Now, I think I'm gonna end. Do I got time? I wanna show my man Louie's video because y'all are going like, that's the preacher, of course you gotta say that. I like when all kinds of new people are coming to Christ full, full send, they're called, they get committed, and they're consistent, and watch what happens with their life. So let's take a look at Louie's video. So before I knew Jesus, I basically was a very selfish person, um, walking in sin daily. I didn't know what it was like to have a relationship with God, and I came to love church through an ex-girlfriend. I realized that, you know, God was asking me to step into something that I couldn't understand at the time. So it was January 17th of 2021 when I decided to do my altar call at the New Love Church building. Um, from there, it's kind of been a journey where I was struggling uh, for the first few months. And after God kind of challenged me to step into some new challenges like serving, um, I approached the question to my fiance at the time and she just didn't trust me to step into that. So I realized that, you know, in God's best, I needed to lay down that relationship in order to walk the direction that he asked me to go. And so when I first got invited to serve, um, Carl, who was in charge of the usher team, asked me to come to a small group, uh, which was in helping me get surrounded, uh, get out of that toxic relationship that I was struggling with. And um, he asked if I wanted to serve on the usher team. And I said, well, I don't really have anything better to do on Sunday. So yeah, let's give it a shot. After stepping into that, it's just been a blessing each and every Sunday. And I've consistently wanted to get more and more. The th one thing that surprised me was how easy it is to serve and how it doesn't have to be this awkward, like, oh, I'm just standing in front of a door. It can be fun and you can smile and you get to meet so many people and you get to really just brighten someone's day as they come into the church and you can be that first point of contact before they even get into the encounters. When people think of serving, oftentimes they think of things that they have to give away, but it's mostly just been blessing after blessing, um, stepping into that serving. The only thing that I'm giving away is my time, but really it's not my time to give anyways. So it's been quite an honor to step into that and just see like I said, how many people's lives I can impact on that, that daily basis of serving. For someone that's thinking of getting in the game but still hesitant on taking that first step, I would really challenge them to just jump in, full send, um, because you, know, you won't know what it's like until you at least give it a try. And like I said, you know, I didn't expect to be on a serve team, but somebody challenged me to step into it. I took the challenge and I fell in love with it. My name is Louis Labuda, and I'm inviting you to get in the game. Thanks, Louis. Good stuff, man. Um, it's cool, too, because in the story, Carl's there. I picture Carl like Elijah <laughs> and Louis like Elisha. And you follow his story, God calling him, tapping his shoulder. And in a relationship, and again, I, you know, there's no shame, no blame, just wasn't the right fit, but he had to make a choice, a conscious choice to move forward. And God was asking him to do, you know, to go a different direction. And then the consistency, it's so cool. Louis like, <laughs> he gets in the game on a serve team. Then he's in a small group on Thursday. Then he hops in ours on Friday. He's like a double dipper, doesn't miss. He's putting himself in a position, again, not our religious duty, but he's like, man, I, I really want to walk in all God has for me. And he's leaving for a ministry school training here at the end of the month, and I'm just, I see it all over you, man. It's humility, it's desire, heart to grow. It's Elisha. The story's Elisha. It's beautiful. And so I don't know where you're at, simple call to action. 
Hop on a team, man. Be a teammate. Get a mentor. Be a, you know, if you, if you're, you've been in the faith for a while, like, and you have sphere of influence, tap a shoulder. Ask if you can help. Jesus said, go make disciples, man. That's what it's about. It's teammates, amen? Let's stand together because it's possible in a room this size and all of our friends, again, all across the world joining us online that you've never really said yes to Team Jesus, the greatest team, the greatest master, the greatest mentor. And Jesus, he's not out to point fingers and blame and shame and headlock. He, he is a great God who is inviting relationship. If you don't have to absolutely leave right now, I just, I just challenge you to pray. If you're a Christian in here, just begin praying. There's someone maybe here right now, you, and you know it because God, like, like me, he's been pursuing you lovingly. He's been he say, I got a plan for your life. I, I want a relationship with you. I want to forgive you. Just as Jim said, all of us, man, we've taken our life and we've blown it. We've, we've sinned. The Bible says it's called sin. We've fallen short of his standard of perfection. But God in his great grace, his great love, he takes the penalty on the cross, brutally murdered. They bury him. Three days later, he raises from the grave, proving who he is. Now, he sends his spirit all throughout the world, and you can sense it in your heart right now. He's drawing you. He says, man, I got something better for your life. I wanna forgive you. I've already paid for that. I wanna forgive you. I wanna begin a relationship. From this day forward, I, I want you to follow me. I, I want you to learn from me. Take my, my yoke upon you. It's easy. My burden is light. My mantle, I wanna be your mentor come join my family. That's what he's asking. So as the band plays, this is your opportunity here in this auditorium. Make your way forward right here. I'll lead you in a prayer. It's a very simple prayer. God, open up my heart. I invite you inside. Full send. I want to commit. So if God's speaking to you, again, don't wait any longer. You come here. I'll lead you in that prayer. I'll connect you with some other teammates to help you. Begin your relationship, begin your journey. So church, begin to pray. Man, go ahead and play. If God's speaking to you, you come now, you come now. It's always been you. Every season of life, every long restless night. It's always been really cool. I, I can just share authentically. This is a privilege for me to connect you with God. This is not phony. This isn't fake. This isn't forced. I'm just trying to share with people what God's done in my life and try to help as many people as I can. You're responding to God. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. It's a simple prayer. But if you mean it with all your heart, man, you're, you're making peace with God. So if you're ready, you can pray this prayer out loud after me. Say, Lord God, I open up my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of all my sin. Wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus. I'm all in. <laughs> Fill me with your spirit a double portion <laughs> and lead me in this life to love you and to help people in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Proud of you, man. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Proud of you. Now listen, I told you I got teammates over here to my right. All they want to do is give you a manual a playbook, a Bible and pray for you once more send you on your way. So if you want to head that direction right now, let's give it up for this young man. Congratulations, man.
proud of you. Come on.